Let's begin today with a valuable public service announcement. If you live in the late 1400s and your nation is going to war with the Aztecs, well, here's a word to the wise. Don't get captured. Really. Just don't. And today you're going to learn why as a part of this podcast and how that relates more than you'd think to the five questions you might want to ask yourself in order to discover, is your faith legit? Welcome to the Sky Pilot Podcast that explores questions of faith, spirituality, and religion. I'm Dan Matthews, and I don't have all the answers, but I do enjoy the questions. Welcome to the podcast where every question is an invitation into a spiritual quest, and you're invited along for the journey. Today, I'm going to give you five questions, and then at the end, I add a bonus question that might be as important as the other five questions combined. So let's get started. If we're going to give five simple questions to evaluate the legitimacy, the power of your faith, then what better place to begin than by traveling back in time to the Aztecs? I'm not sure that I follow. No, probably not, but you will, I promise. The ancient Aztec Empire existed from the 1300s to the mid-1500s, and they were ultimately conquered by a combination of invading Spanish forces, the conquistadors, and diseases brought to the Aztecs by the same invading Spanish forces. They were a fascinating society. Just as a point, they did not use money. Their entire financial system existed as a barter and exchange economy, which is unusual for an economy as large as theirs was at the time. It was understood to everyone who was an Aztec that the empire owned everything, all the land. So people were allowed to farm and cultivate the land in exchange for taxes. Nothing really new here, but interestingly, this tax was not so much a portion of their produce, as is usual in this kind of system, but instead was an expected amount of service or labor to be done for the empire each year as a form of tax payment. The Aztecs were very religious, and although there were a number of gods worshipped by the people as a whole, the empire itself primarily focused its attention and worship on the sun god, Huitzilopochtli. I bet you practice that word a lot. (laughs) Who was also the god of war and is generally represented as an eagle or a hummingbird in their art, often looking like a person dressed up as an eagle or hummingbird. And he's often depicted holding his minion, a snake, or technically a fire serpent who did his bidding. When the Spanish gave their justification for conquering the Aztecs, part of their reasoning was religious. It was the human sacrifices performed as a part of Aztec religious rituals, which they found barbaric. For a while, modern scholars wondered how accurate these reports actually were, But archaeologists have since confirmed that human sacrifice was indeed a significant part of the Aztec faith. Their understanding of the world was that Huitzilopochtli, the sun god, was in constant battle with the chaos of darkness. And what he fed upon that kept him strong to do this important battle was, well, was unfortunately beating human hearts. And they were offered to the god as a means of keeping the chaos at bay. Many of those sacrificed were prisoners who were taken captive in battle, but some were actually voluntary and members of the Aztec society because it was considered a great honor and a sure and certain way to go immediately to heaven. Now, I tell this story because though I'm generally try to be, not one to judge someone else's faith, I draw the line at religions that require human sacrifice as an essential part of their theology. Oh, good. Then we're safe on that front, right? Yeah, well, you would think so, wouldn't you? But not so fast. I would argue that there are other forms of human sacrifice in which no blood is shed, but it still causes human suffering and pain. Some of these questions, the first three questions, actually, that I'm going to ask revolve around, well, human sacrifice in one form or another. So first question, let's get straight into it. Does your faith require growth and obedience from you? Or instead, does it demand a change from everyone else? I think there are plenty of faiths that sit in a theological ivory tower assuming that they have arrived. They are safe. They are holy. And now their existence, 
their existence as a faith is, well, primarily for the purpose of being God's chosen people who spend their time pointing out the iniquities of the world. This form of faith is best summed up with the notion that I am righteous, and I know it. You are unrighteous, and you seem to be oblivious to it. Good thing I'm here. My holy responsibility is to tell you how messed up you are and why you need to change and be more like me. My first point is that a healthy faith is chosen to inform and direct the life of the person who chooses the faith, not everyone else. Okay, moving on. Question number two. Does your faith require someone else to lose in order for you to win. And I'm reminded of the animated movie, The Incredibles. In the movie, there's a family of superheroes with superpowers that are battling a supervillain named Syndrome who's out to destroy all other superheroes. Syndrome doesn't have any superpowers himself. Instead, he's a genius inventor and one point threatens to give his invention, sell his inventions to all people everywhere so that everyone will have superpowers. Um I believe you just used the word super no less than seven times in 20 seconds. That's averaging its use every two or three seconds. Absolutely amazing. Hmm. Thanks. That was not a compliment. Anyway, he plans on giving everyone his invention so they can all have powers. That sounds pretty cool, right? But listen to his motivation for doing so. I'll give them heroics. I'll give them the most spectacular heroics anyone's ever seen. And when I'm old and I've had my fun, I'll sell my inventions so that everyone can be superheroes. Everyone can be super. And when everyone's super, <laughs> no one will be. <laughs> when everyone is super, no one will be. Being super is only valuable if there are people who aren't. And that perfectly reflects the theology behind, well, at least a sizable portion within Christianity that I know. Going to heaven, being saved, having the gifts that Jesus offers is only truly valuable to that portion of Christianity if there are some who don't get the gifts of God and are left to suffer, are left behind. Matter of fact, this is the allure of the whole Left Behind book and movie series, which were born out of an idea called premillennialism, an idea that Jesus is going to come back before the end times and take all the good people, all the holy people, all the righteous people directly to heaven and leave everyone else behind to suffer the coming tribulations. So my second question is really this, does your faith require for some people to suffer? some people to lose in order for you to win, for you to receive the gifts of God. Third question, do you define your faith by comparing it to other faiths? Look, if you're a Presbyterian, you're a Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, and that's your tradition because that was your denomination growing up or that's the one you chosen because its beliefs and practices work for you, then more power to you. That's fantastic. But if you're a member of a denomination, a faith, a church that spends a lot of time talking about other faith traditions, other churches, other denominations, and how you are right and they are wrong, then you don't so much believe something and follow something as you do dislike another denomination and you're reacting against them. I've known lots of Protestants who spend more time talking about the errors of what they think or the Catholic faith than their own faith and what they do believe. The sign of a healthy faith is that you believe what you believe because, wait for it, it's helpful to you and it informs your life choices, not because it wins in comparison to what your neighbor believes. Question number four, is your faith comfortable with you wondering, with you asking questions, or are you expected to accept the theology as stated by your church, your denomination, your faith without question? And if you've listened to more than two episodes of this podcast, shoot, if you even watched and listened to the intro of this podcast one time, then you know I'm really big on questions. Now, that doesn't mean that your faith group redefines itself every time someone within it asks a question, but a member should be allowed to wonder. 
question and sometimes even doubt on the way to growing in their faith. Finally, question number five, is your faith motivated by fear or joy? Does your faith help you see the wonderful, creative, and loving Spirit of God at work in the world? Or is your faith teaching you to fear the reprisals of an angry and vindictive God who wants to be followed out of fear and wants to punish those who don't toe the line? As a Christian, and speaking from my personal reading of the Bible, if God was really all about judgment and punishment to be swiftly inflicted upon the sinful, that didn't take Jesus. God could have done that simply the way things already stood. When I read scripture and the stories of Jesus, the incarnate form of God in our midst, then the only reason for that that makes any sense to me is to be sure that humanity knows of God's love and God's holy desire to be in a relationship with us. I had a friend who lived next door to me in college, and he was very religious, and he would often jokingly say to me, and I do want to say, it was truly joking. This was a running kind of gag between the two of us. But he would say, Dan, better change your ways or you're going to wind up extra crispy. Now, this is the perfect description of what I'm talking about. Does your faith tell you that all of creation is filled with signs of a wonderful, loving, and generous God? Or does it tell you to straighten up, fly right, or wind up extra crispy? That's all. Five questions that I hope help you evaluate your faith and perhaps move it towards something that's more helpful and healthy for you. Oh, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell. Oh yeah, bonus question. Does your faith encourage you to make the world a better place for everyone? This might be as important as all the other ones combined. Does your faith encourage you to make the world a better place for everyone? Not does it drive you to convert them to your faith and now that will make the world a better place. No. Does your faith help you, encourage you, give you direction towards making the world a better place for others? And this is the key. Even if those others have never heard nor will never practice the faith that you follow. And that truly is all for today. So what do you think? Do you agree? Disagree? Think I missed an important question that should be added to the list? Let me know. Tell me what you think in the comment section below. And as always, I would love to hear from you. And on your spiritual journey, may you ask questions, seek answers, and boldly go wherever the quest takes you. Thanks for joining us here today and being part of the SkyPilot Faith Quest community. This is a great place to ask questions you wouldn't feel comfortable or safe asking in other places. And remember, the sign of a strong faith, solid religion, or healthy spiritual journey is not certainty, but that you keep asking questions.